season. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming in today. And uh, some of you have been with me all week. A couple have just joined for this talk. But uh, Ralph is a, a very good friend of mine. We go back many years, and he's one of the uh, uh, coolest, wildest guys I know, out-of-the-box thinkers, just fantastic, uh, <laughs> full of surprises. And uh, Ralph made quite a name for himself in, uh, uh, you call yourself the, hey, Brendan, you're sharing your mic, I'm sharing your video. I didn't know you could share it. I didn't think we enabled that. But whatever the case is, uh, uh, Ralph has uh, networked himself in Hollywood. He's been involved in a couple of movies and uh, other projects and just really taken off. It's great to see your stuff there. So uh, I asked Ralph if he could help me out this week and, uh, and, and talk about what he's been doing. So Ralph, take it away. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. You hear that? We got we got soundtrack. This is what I learned in Hollywood. See? Yeah, you're yeah. off a dark there. That looks uh, <laughs> part of the uh, the Hollywood mystique there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that's the uh, uh, that's the iPhone 10 sound over there. Um, so no, I'm actually in my uh, home slash offices at the moment here in Tallinn, Estonia. How many of you know where that is? Anybody? Any anybody know where Talon Estonia is? Hey, I, I wonder. Can we maybe uh, just, uh, Brendan? Did you want to say something? Because uh, uh, chime in, or you? No, no. All right, go for it. Yeah, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you moved to Estonia. You had a lot of excitement out there. I was bringing something up to my class about Estonia. What's going on over there? How's well, actually, yeah. Hang on. Let me let me go up here. Um, yes, there is uh, a lot going on in Estonia. It's actually. Uh, referred to as a digital nation, uh, and it's a small country of about 1.4 million people. Uh, it uh, borders Russia and St. Petersburg, and uh, it's the closest kind of, it's, it's across the uh, the Finnish uh, sea there, the Finnish uh, whatever it's called, which is the uh, Finland's on the other side, Helsinki, and um, Estonia is known as a digital nation because it's the first country to have an e-residency program, so you can be a uh, electronic resident of this country and never set foot here, yet uh, open a bank account here and do business out of here, which is kind of interesting because they have 0% corporate income tax. So they, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't actually have any tax on income coming into a corporation here. Um, and then of course, once you get into the rest of their tax structure, it's just a lot simpler to deal with than, than the US to be honest. So uh, that's one of the reasons it brought me out here. And uh, and I actually I had never really done this much in Europe, and since I was getting more involved with <clears throat> the, with the European space as well, um, this is actually an interesting place to be kind of headquartered in Europe, uh, in Northern Eastern Europe. It's very cold here. It's about uh, right now about minus seventeen deg degrees Celsius, and uh, and it's very beautiful in the summer here. It's a very old town. Goes back in since I know Larry loves history, the Hanseatic League. Uh, this was the one of the main ports for the Hanseatic League back in the 1300s or something like that. So it's a very, very old town. Kind of uh, crazy when you're looking around for an apartment and it says built in 1492. Um, <laughs> you kind of have to go, what? I'm going to um, have to have a Netflix uh, miniseries on that place then during that time period because if they don't have a Netflix miniseries, I'm, I'm not really up on that that history as much, unless it's Asia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they don't, they don't. And it's, it's actually a very picturesque place, but uh, they don't do much here. There is a film festival here uh, that happens, uh, that just happened a couple of months ago. And uh, it's a very interesting place, very uh, international place right now. Uh, it's actually was the presidency of the EU for a while, um, until recently. And uh, it, this is also where NATO cyber security defense is because uh, this country was the first to actually uh, deal with a cyber war. They were attacked by the Russians uh, during, uh, this was 2006 or seven, I believe. You can look it up, but basically they, a lot of their infrastructure was dropped and brought down as a result of it. And uh, after that, they actually went more electronic, but they're a very resilient place. And uh, of course, because of the history of the Soviets here, um, they were also taught very engineering minds. So there's a lot that's, uh, that's uh, kind of interesting and happening here. Um, but uh, the one thing most of you might recognize that came out of here is Skype. So Skype started in Estonia. 
and of course now is a it's just a Microsoft's product, but they still have a presence here. There's a few other major startups here that are interesting too. Uh, there's one called TransferWise, which has to move money around a lot faster and with less fees than it would be to wire money. And uh, and then a company called Taxify, which is very much like Uber for taxis. So Uber's not very big here. It's it's more this Taxify, which is a local company for the region. Um, so you see a lot of different things. There's this whole kind of startup world uh, that exists out here that just didn't, you know, I had never really experienced in the, in the US, to be honest, and very, very big conferences around uh, this whole startup world. Uh, everybody in Europe is trying to sort of position their region and or country as the sort of next Silicon Valley. So now, now if you brought up, what's, what's the name of the, uh, the, the car that you said that it competes with uh, or is instead of Uber? It's called Taxify. Taxify. Now, uh, I've got a few people here from Peter Diamandis' uh, Abundance Group, and one of the hot things in, in uh, these abundant technologies, uh, exponential technologies, is the uh, self-driving vehicles, and Uber's been doing a lot. Do you know if they've they got involved in that at all? I don't think Taxify has yet been involved in that. They're a much smaller company that, that, uh, that has done very well in, in competing with an Uber. I mean, there's, there's Uber here, but you won't get anywhere near as many cars, number one. Number two, you, it's not as, as cheap. You remember the, the great car hacks of, of the last couple of years and, and the, the, the DEF CON shows. I'm just curious, you know, uh, what are your thoughts on, on some of these uh, autonomous vehicles? And I just saw this whole AI hacking thing. One of my big um, uh, concerns with it, you have the, all these fears of AI takeovers and they're, they're going to get smarter than us and they're going to be, you know, uh, like the Terminator. And I don't worry that. What I'm more worried is that hackers get into them and make it look like it was the AIs, you know, that, that took over on their own. And, uh, I, you know, I'm sure the early ones will, will go through that. Have you been keeping up on any of the uh, uh, car hacks? Well, actually, there was a conference recently in, uh, in Munich, Germany here that this uh, organization called Pioneer Festival, they have a very big uh, conference that happens in Austria. Um, and uh, the, it's kind of interesting, I guess, if the conferences here, there's, there's a very different, like that one you have to be invited to, and it's about four or 5,000 people, but you can't really sign up for it. Um, and uh, Pioneers just did a recent, uh, that I was supposed to be at, but it conflicted with another conference here that I was speaking at in Latvia, but um, they did one on just basically autonomous vehicles and cars, obviously in Munich, Germany, with the likes of BMW, Audi, and um, on all those type of folks, and and, uh, and there was actually a, a talk on um, specifically the hacking of these uh, systems, these autonomous uh, driving systems, right? Um, and of course, all of these European companies are already trying this. They're already working on it. In fact, uh, in uh, in Munich, they actually had BMW had a couple of cars that that they were showing off that they have been testing, um, which is also where they test all of their all of their cars. Um, Kind of interesting, we shot uh, Snowden in Munich, Germany. And when you were driving around, you'd see these cars that, uh, that, are, that they're wrapped, you know? They're, they're completely wrapped in like this weird black and white gray clam camouflage type thing. So, so you can't tell what the lines of the car are uh, because BMW is based there and headquartered there. So you, you, know, you have employees driving around test cars uh, and it was uh, interesting, again, this was even a couple of years ago, where you, had, you, know, you, you noticed somebody was being driven. There was nobody in the driver's seat. Um, so so they, they definitely have been testing some of this. And, and of course, there's a lot of concerns into, uh, you know, anything and everything can be hacked. Uh, I think back to your point about the, uh, the AI, uh, I wouldn't call it argument, I'd say more of a discussion uh, on really what is AI. And I, I like to jokingly say that it's, uh, it's really more a matter of, of next level automation because it's really just automation of fill in the blank. Um, uh, more intelligent automation, but it's ultimately still yeah. automation. And, and you're bringing a point up that I totally aside with what we were talking about malware earlier in the week. And I said, you know, people, uh, we, want, we have to stop these AIs because of you know, the term thing. I said, guys, you understand that we've already had it for years. And uh, I was sort of a conficker to me was an example of, of an AI malware, AI driven malware, because you said it's just automated and it got out of the hands of the original creators. 
you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, you might have kept up with it more than I did. Did they ever figure out what the payload of Conficker was supposed to be, or do we only see its propagation mechanism? Yeah, and that's, you know, it's not the first time, as you mentioned, uh, that, that, you know, that uh, <clears throat> some automation has gotten out of the hands of the automator. Um, so, uh, so the same thing applies to the AI, and I think one of the ways to, to explain it, uh, you know, or to think about it from a technical perspective is that ultimately, uh, for the most part, uh, still to this day, all computers uh, ultimately speak a low-level language like assembly. Um, and at the end of the day, if you understand that, uh, that everything else is at a higher level, you can ultimately, and, and most of this AI we're talking about, or, you know, I call it IA, right? intelligent automation, is really happening at higher levels than that. So a hacker can always figure out ultimately how to speak down at the machine language level. And uh, that's not where AI is happening. And for the most part, um, you know, it, there's, there's ways to get down to that by finding flaws in, in the higher level programming languages and, and or programming itself. So, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting subject that everybody gets around, like if Terminator were to happen. But like you said, it's more realistic that even if that happened, and even with, you know, unforeseen, you know, security, um, uh, uh, you know, better security in whatever ways that we might not yet have seen uh, in the, within the languages themselves, uh, you're still ultimately going to have that that possibility. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of figuring out the logic and figuring out how to use logic. I think we've seen, you know, everything from bots that are AI uh, driven uh, that immediately have been sort of taken advantage of, if you will. So it's an interesting, uh, you know, discussion to have but uh, i don't think that we're we're facing a terminator scenario by any no, I, I, yeah i don't i don't foresee that actually happening myself uh so what have you been working on these days now i i know uh, your seguro stuff and and i want you once you start uh, sharing with us where you are right now on this internet of everything uh well yeah so you know we're in town estonia as i mentioned uh we actually several of us came out here you know sean aries another oh, hacker sure. Uh, Ex instructor as well is sitting over there. Let's see. Hey, John. Hey. I'm behind screens. I'm behind screens, and uh, and so we actually, you know, we there's uh, four or five of us uh, Americans are now in and out of here. Uh, some of us here more than than uh, than in America right now, as we're in the process of developing this app um, called Seguru, which is uh you know really kind of uh, my uh passion for addressing the whole security issue on a broader scale which is by actually not uh, you know i realized that for the last whatever 25 years that we've been involved in this industry it's it's always been working for companies it's never really been providing uh security solutions to individuals and at the end of the day companies and, uh, and companies and government and call whatever you want are constructs that are ultimately a bunch of individuals. And so you address the individual problem, you're also addressing the, glo the global issues. In fact, you see more data from the global perspective than you do from, uh, from a corporate perspective, no matter how big the company is. So, so we decided to go in that direction by taking things that we had done actually in the past and knowledge and experience and applying it to a much, uh, much more scalable, uh, not only business model, but uh, the technology problem. Yeah, for those that don't know, uh, Ralph and I, uh, uh, with a, a number of people, uh, used to do a lot of uh, government work. We worked with pretty much every three-letter three -letter agency in the United States. And um, I mostly taught them uh, management stuff and, and how, uh, you know, the deeper workers of cryptography and what they should do to protect themselves. But Ralph got involved in that as well as well as showing them how easily he could break through their stuff. And Ralph is a penetration tester who's done some amazing uh, <laughs> compromises all with the authority of senior management to let's see if you can get in. And he's done some amazing uh, ways to break into people's uh, sites. So. It's just fantastic. But all, as you said, it's, we've always done work for, for large uh, department defense agencies and banks and stuff like that. But now we're, you're involved in, in helping everyday people. Is that right? Yeah, that's the, that's the point. And a good segue into this hacker 
thing in term, right? So, you know, I, I like to uh, kind of explain things at a higher level now, which is, you know, as you know, Larry, we come back from developing course materials that are generally very technical, uh, whether they're hands-on or not, um, they're still intended for an audience that, uh, that, has, that meets some level of prerequisites coming into our classes in the past. And so now, over the last few years, and, and, and with this segue to a lot of these European conferences, which, which have very different, uh, or global conferences that, are, that are, have very different you know, audiences, um, one of the things I've discovered to do, and, and Larry does this really well with CISSP, because for those of you who are just taking this class and getting to the CISSP thing, um, you know, this is probably one of the most boring classes I've ever sat through. Not Larry's. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I, hopefully my students this week have agreed to that. <laughs> the content itself is uh, grueling, uh, and, uh, and it's just not fun. And uh, Larry makes it fun and makes it uh, understandable. Um, so in doing the same, it's, it's actually a lot harder to take, you know, very technical things and, and things that you explain normally with a lot of words and actually try to put it into a picture or try to put it into a, into a fewer words. So, uh, you know, this, this hacker terminology, one of the ways I like to explain it is that ultimately, if you look it up, the meaning of, on one side, it says that it's an expert, especially at computers in solving problems or breaking in or whatever you want to call it. But at the same time, the, me the second meaning also says it's a person who basically uh, engages in a skill, in some sort of activity without any skill or talent. And uh, the funny thing about it is, you know, we all start with meaning too uh, in life <laughs> and uh, ultimately figure out what those are. And the, the more time we spend and the more that we like something, which becomes uh, that thing that we tend to call a talent. Um, so and skill so you know ultimately these these two people are the same uh, but you start by being you know making sort of this uh, messed up robot over here but ultimately you have a working robot right and that's how, how hacking really is you know and at a higher level i found this to be a, a very way a very good way to explain hackers because i say a lot of people in these audiences including yourselves uh, are hackers, you just don't really know it. Because ultimately there's four kinds of people in the world. So you've got people who know and people who do things with that knowledge. And you, then you have people who know but don't do anything with their knowledge. Uh, and then you have people who don't know, but they still do. Um, and then you have people who just don't know and don't do. Um, and the, the, the two types that make up hackers are people who know and do and people who don't know and do. And that, that is a lot of us. And it's a, it's a good way to explain it. Um, and and this not, doesn't just apply for computers, but like I said, in life. Now, yeah, we've got some politicians, hypothetically, that don't know and yet still do. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, there's your four kinds of people in the entire world, right? And whether they don't know or do, I mean, again, those two type stereotypes would, you could say, constitute the beginnings of somebody who can be a hacker, right? Now, you, you know, we've got the cyber crime as a service is, a, is an actual term. And... Uh, you know, the statistics are statistics, but bottom line is, you know, you've got things like a thousand people uh, every minute are hacked around the world uh, with the annual economic cost of these breaches growing into estimated astronomical numbers. They say it was 300 billion, uh, I think it was last year, and going to be 1 trillion globally in this trajectory does not, uh, it's obviously a negative one that's going to impact consumers and obviously this has already impacted consumers via credit card theft, identity theft, job loss, and stock market volatility. Now we've got cryptocurrencies and we've got all kinds of different things that are happening and that, uh, that this, these problems are the same. Um, so the, 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 this is one of the you know, high level ways that I have to say just the problems inside of cybersecurity. And then you've got the fact that we've got the internet of everything with uh, Cisco saying that by 2020, we're gonna have 50 billion devices online. Um, every industry from healthcare to energy to, you know, con construction to you name it is part of the internet of everything now. And everything is being connected in some way or another. Um, you know, I've done a lot out here in, in Europe with healthcare, which is a little bit different than healthcare in the U.S. as a result that they don't have insurance here. So it is mostly socialized healthcare. But the interesting thing about that is places like Norway are all connected when it comes to healthcare, including uh, those consumer devices. You know, your, your, your uh, 
what do they call it, Fitbit, and your all of these different devices also are used um, in their sort of telemedicine practices. So, you know, the hospital knows what the pharmacy knows, the pharmacy knows what the doctor knows. All of these systems are interconnected, and their biggest concern is what happens if somebody outside of Norway gains access to this, and how would it be used? And so, in theory, the hospital should know, but it's amazing how much paper I still have to fill out when I get a new doctor. I was like, really? I just said I had to go from a, a new doctor to then get some blood work done and then reduplicate all this stuff. And I think it's they're so afraid of violations or they just don't want to hire an IT guy. I don't know what's going on there. I, I'm sorry. It's just, that is a place that really needs to be re-engineered. Well, that's a, you know, it, it is different. Uh, it, it, like I said, it really is different in some of these connected countries. Um, uh, there's a still paperwork, yes, but it's not the same level of paperwork, bless you. And, uh, and uh, you know, for example, uh, again, not necessarily with the healthcare thing here, but when it comes to doing business, for example, in Estonia, you actually never print anything anymore. Everything is digitally signed. Uh, I have this uh, little card here, I'll show you. Uh, and, and this is all public knowledge, so there's nothing you can take off this card that and this card is used to sign digitally every single thing you can imagine. Every contract, That's uh, this, yeah. this is, is used to log into bank accounts. There is no passwords. Everything is assigned to this card and two different pins and the same number is attached to everything healthcare here. So you pretty much that, that card uh, works as everything for you. So that is your identity. Now you lose the card, it is quite a pain in the butt, I'll tell you that. Um, but, um, the, this is a, a growing digital landscape and, and, you know, a country like Estonia can do this because they have 1.4 million people. I think the number is something around 80 to 90% of voting here happens online at home. That's so when funny. you talk about <clears throat> the voting issues that we have and it all happens with that card. So it's kind of interesting how, uh, you know, again, they can test things here. They can make mistakes and it really doesn't have the same kind of impact you know when you consider that there's probably 1.5 million people living in my neighborhood in los angeles and with it being so, signed i'm sure you know hopefully they're logging it which we don't do with our electronic voting and it's just amazing to us as security information security it's like the, the basic principles of, of of access control is that you authenticate you authorize and you account for what people do and yet our electronic voting systems what little we have don't account for anything so there's no way to go back and audit those records in the United States. Just awful. Yeah, it's just kind of again, it's it's pretty mind blowing when you when you know consider that it's, it's especially around the world, people think the U.S. is is it, you know, um, and uh, then when you come to a little place like this and and things are so much easier, that it actually makes you have to like completely rethink. Really, that's it, you know. Um, you you have a you know you have a cashless bank here. No I, mean, I think of a lot of it is regulation. You know, they, they, they overregulate companies, and that's why a lot of these cryptocurrencies don't even want to start in the United States. They're like, no, I'm not going to get touched with it. You know? Yeah, it's also uh, it's also the fact that I think when it goes back to your thing about logging, as an example, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that they've said, but they utilize a lot of uh, of, uh, of blockchain like technology from the beginning. So as far as logging, and this goes across the board. Um, because they're, they are using obviously PKI for mm -hmm. everything. Um, but they also have been very open to and very early on, there are probably three or four cryptocurrency conferences that happen and blockchain conferences that happen in Tallinn. Um, so, so they're very forward looking. And again, they can try a lot of things. And you know, they even uh, had a, it, it, it was in the news about uh, Estonia backing a potential cryptocurrency, um, their SD coin. Uh, so it's kind of interesting, but you know the point of this is, you know, the second major problem is the growth. Obviously, these, this is growing in numbers that uh, you know were never really expected. And when you consider the fact that uh, you know the people who wrote the protocols, if you will, who wrote TCP/IP and C and all these different things, uh, they really never, you know, they couldn't even conceive that this many people would be using. Um, these technologies it wasn't necessarily built with not sharing or selective oh, sharing oh, sure. so and then you know the third major issue that we have is the fact that uh, you know there is a major scarcity of cybersecurity professionals across the entire globe 
Um, I think Forbes in 2016, at the end of 2016, did an article saying that there's 1 million cybersecurity job openings that do not get filled on a yearly basis. It's a million jobs a year uh, that no one can fill. And I can tell you that, that the same applies in just anywhere else in the world. It's not just, that's not, definitely not in the U.S. alone. So, number one, you have two different issues. You have the management issue and you have the technical issue. Um, there is a shortage of engineers and analysts and penetration testers and all the different classifications within the industry. But there's also a massive, massive shortage of management because most of those people don't have management skills. That's why they work with computers. So uh, it's, a, it's kind of a real issue here because we can't really address the, at the same rate, if you will, of these you know, cyber crime as a service. Um, and of course, that continues to be lucrative in so many different ways, in ways that wasn't lucrative a few years ago. So, you know, you, you talk about, I think, one of the biggest issues that, that, uh, that we've seen, um, both on the offensive and defensive side of things, is how long it takes and, and sort of the numbers involved with detection of a compromise. When you consider that, uh, on average, the numbers say that uh, it's 229 days before uh, you detect that an attacker has been in your network. That is the average. That's not yeah. the high yeah. or the low. So, you oh, know, yeah. it's not yeah. a few weeks. It's it's months before you know you've been hacked. Yeah. And I think we can the, tell you from experience. I was going to say mm -hmm. in, the, in the federal government a few years ago, Office of Management Budget said that it was something like uh, 18 months in a, in a DoD before they realized somebody was in there. Exactly, and uh, that's. Uh, I mean, I can tell you about. Definitely places that we are aware of that, you know, hackers may have been in for years before uh, they were detected. Years, not not 12 months. I'm not, you know, I'm talking about two or three years before they've been detected, if Five, six. ever. <laughs> if still, they're in there and have not been detected by major players. So detection is really uh, more the problem than it is prevention. The idea of prevention, uh, to be honest, is, is a bit of a fallacy. I, I always like to use the analogy of the earthquake and the hurricane. And uh, that is having lived both in Florida, where we have hurricanes, and living in California, where we have earthquakes. The truth is that cybersecurity uh, or hacking, uh, in the negative term, on the internet is a natural disaster that happens on the internet because it is an ecosystem, it is an environment just like the earth. And just like the earth, there are things called natural disasters that we cannot stop. And, and those include tsunamis and such, right? So, uh, However, we have technology, uh, weather technology, meteorology, that we can now tell that there's a hurricane brewing and that it's headed for potentially Miami. And, uh, and, and we have all these models and things that we can do. So there's the tech that allows us to detect something and then, you know, move accordingly. Like, I don't know, go to Disney World for the weekend. Um, but we don't have that with an earthquake. We don't have that with a tsunami. Uh, it just we have no idea how big it's going to be, when it's coming, how long it's going to last, and that is what cybersecurity currently is. Um, that's what this issue currently is. It is a tsunami. It is. Uh, it's going to happen. It's going to keep happening. And no matter how much money and how much tech you think you can throw at the prevention issue, the real issue is that we should be thinking more detection than prevention. Uh, when you consider also that it takes about 27 days, and I can tell you from having handled many legal cases on the forensic side that it takes a lot more than 20 days to resolve a cyber attack. When you take something like the Sony hack, that took months and months and months and hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to resolve, if you can call it resolved. Um, the fact that, you know, most of these hacks, when, when we're talking about, when you think about that 69% of those attacks that we're talking about uh, the organization does not find out because their internal IT and security department found out. They found out because somebody externally told them. You consider the, ta the target hacks, um, all of those type of major hacks that we've heard about. It wasn't that their internal people found out about it. It was that someone else, a partner and our customer, uh, informed them of this. So, uh, you know, again, only 31% of those were internally found, discovered. And the average cost of one of these attacks that has been thrown around is $7.2 million. Now, I can tell you from some of the entertainment cases I've done is that that is actually pretty accurate. Uh, and some of these are, like, crazy to think, you know, uh, something like, uh, you know, the, the, the Twilight Breaking Dawn breach 
I can tell you it costs upwards of $7 million because the time, the moment it becomes a, a, a hack, a publicly known breach, it is not a technology issue. It is a legal one. And, uh, and, and that costs money, lots and lots of money. So, uh, you know, that brings us to one of the things we always talk about, but, you know, management and uh, just folks in general, even in, in the consumer life, they go, oh, well, what are the, what are the chances? Low probability. What are the chances that that's going to happen to me? Um, and especially when you start dealing with certain technology issues and you go, well, have we looked at this and have we looked at that? So things that are, tend to be very low probability also have, tend to be things with very high impact. And these are some of the highest concerns, especially within truly life critical services that use technology, such as healthcare, uh, such as in certain cases, uh, infrastructure like power and energy. Uh, because these things do have the ability to affect human life in ways that something like financial doesn't really. You're not going to die because that machine is down. Okay. One, of, one of the things I heard about healthcare too is like, you know, you can hire a Ralph H. Mendia to penetrate your network and see if he can get through. And a lot of agencies, Department of Defense, they're very into that. They want to see if someone can get through. And if he knocks something down, then, you know, it is accidentally, you know, it's hard. It's like sparring. You might accidentally hurt somebody and he knocks down a server and they reboot it. What happens in a hospital? They try to could see if someone breaks in and you accidentally knock down a life support system and you don't reboot Bob. So a lot of penetration testers like, Ralph, avoid the hospital. They don't want to get involved in that because it's very risky to test their security. So a lot of people feel that's about as vulnerable as you get. And yet, as you say, what a high impact loss of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and like you said, Larry, it's very hard to test those systems because you know, in a real life scenario. Um, number one, uh, what's very interesting about, like I said, what I've seen with the, a lot of the European, especially the Nordic healthcare systems, is they actually do a sort of, uh, even before they build a hospital, they actually build mock-ups of the hospital with the equipment, the doctors, the nurses, the robots walking around, and they actually do all of this and do all of their testing in this sort of made up scenario. And uh, before they actually ever built the hospital and made the purchase orders for these devices. Uh, so they know what, the, what they're dealing with before they, they go in and build them as, as opposed to, you know, so they have to deal with less of the legacy problems that exist in, in, in healthcare. But, uh, you know, a good example of, you know, you're saying what happens if those systems are down. You know, one of my earliest jobs was at a, at a hospital, at a children's hospital in Miami. And uh, I deployed the first medical charting systems. Uh, that in the entire country that was one of the only hospitals that ever had medical charting and the interesting thing is you know doctors and nurses fought this too tooth and nail they did not want this because they don't really want to have to learn anything new um and so they didn't want to have to you know they at every meeting they were just bitching moaning and complaining about no we don't really want this okay and of course it still went in and a, a year after it went in the funny thing was the same doctors, the same nurses who were, uh, you know, so unhappy about having to deal with electronic medical charting now had to deal with coming off of electronic medical charting because we had a hurricane coming. And we went into these procedures that, are, that, that we have to take the systems down. And, and this, is the, uh, this is the beauty and the, and the ugly side of adoption of technology is that the same people who hated it had now adopted it such that they forgot how to chart on paper. They didn't even remember where the paper was. Doctors who've been using paper for 20 years forgot what paper charting looked like. And it was scary because I'm walking around saying, well, how, you know, how are you charting then? And they said, well, we'll chart when the system comes back up. And well, how do you remember? Ah, I remember. So, that's, <laughs> um, so, so, you know, these are black swan events. And at the end of the day, now we have all this cloud and so much movement to the cloud. And, you know, there's this funny saying that there is no cloud. It's just other people's computers because that's what it is. Amazon and uh, Google and all these great companies that provide these great solutions uh, that are very elastic and, uh, you know, certainly have their value. But at the end of the day, do you really understand who's responsible for what when it's not your computer anymore? We used to have to go into a data center and build a rack and wait for the power. And, uh, you know, it, it certainly wasn't elastic. Okay. But uh, so there is a lot of value to this. But having worked at a company like Terramark, 
which uh, was uh, ran the federal cloud, and uh, you know, and that's now Verizon company. But uh, we dealt with that very early on. What happens when you have a, a you know legal request for forensics on a hard drive that you don't really have a hard drive, and that data is spread across multiple countries? Which laws apply? Um, what exactly are you responsible for? What is behind their infrastructure? What is a plugged in? What can you plug into that infrastructure? What can't you plug in? And again, there's just so much around this term that uh, is really a great marketing term. I'll give it to whoever came up with that. Um, but again, I think the thing to realize too is that you know most of us that are in the field, uh, not only of cybersecurity but of technology in general, are number one, first and foremost, consumers of technology. Well, and then we're also creators of technology. You're neither one or you're both, and there are certainly more ones than there are both. Um, there are certainly more consumers of technology than there are consumers and creators of technology, and, and that is one of the things that, you know, um, like I said, out here to try to address. You know, when you consider that still the old school hacking is still what works best. Um, and what I mean by that is- What's you, the password? Password? No. One, two, three, four, five. No. Do you have a dog? Yeah, her name's Muffin. Is the password Muffin? Yes, it is. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> Truth is, is that still works. And it works very well. And it works even better now because it used to be that the number one uh, sort of method for doing social engineering was on the phone. Uh, the phone, that thing we put up to our ear. How many of us actually use it that way that much anymore? Uh, when you think about the fact that smartphones are used more by for clicking, uh, if you want to call it that, than they are used as phones. So with all the different things that we do in social media, it is very easy to combine now uh, online social engineering techniques with actual technical hacks that yield far greater numbers than making 300 phone calls. So uh, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a real interesting issue because most people believe what their computer says. And uh, it's very easy to make your computer say something else. Um, but you'll, you'll believe it because, again, the majority of us, we see, we see this and we have no way or knowledge of being able to to confirm it. Um, so that's, that's part of what I'm doing out here. So there's an interesting uh, thing that I like to use in a lot of pr presentations that I'll uh, tell you guys, the Jack exercises, which were developed by Pete Herzog, who runs the uh, ISACOM organization and the Austin certification. And uh, these were very interesting. You know, he, 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 this kind of comes from a, an academic perspective, the way he built this, uh, these classes. and. Uh, He's an old friend. I've known Pete for 20 years and actually met him for the first time. He's in Barcelona, right? Yes, he's in Barcelona. He married a, 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 Barca, a, a Spanish girl and he's been out there for a long time. He's got two beautiful kids and uh, he also is a musician. So Yeah, he's commented um, on some of my music and he also liked my model train setup. I thought that's pretty cool. Uh, I see yeah, Jeff had some questions. Go type them in, Jeff, and then uh, we, we can address them when they're ready. But go ahead. Don't, don't hold back and take Yeah, I can't see that window until I come out of this view, but so I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. But this is actually the reason I mention it because it's a really kind of interesting way to explain the mindset and process that a hacker will go through. And it's also a very good exercise to use in your hiring processes. So when you're hiring people or you're talking to people, it's a good way to identify the creative people because that's one of the big... Uh, uh, you know, challenges, if you will, is that, uh, you know, engineering and, and hacking is somewhat, somewhat in that space, is seen more as a science and not an art. Uh, but this is one of those that's truly more of an art and not just a science. Even though there is a science to it, it's much like cooking. Uh, yes, you can be very scientific about cooking, but uh, there is certainly something different about certain chefs and the way that they do things. Same thing to, you can say about music, right? Um, so, the Jack exercises in, in one of them, and you can find this stuff on the Austin, um, or at least on their site if they still put, provide it. You know, one of the interesting ones that they had is they have different ones, Jack the Doctor, Jack the, and I like to use the Jack the Electrician a lot because, like I said, it's really good for new hires and for people that you're speaking to, but, you know, one of those things was to think, you know, you have a light bulb and you have a switch on the wall and you have to think of 10 ways to turn off the light. 
And so we tend to come up with those first five right away, you know, flip the switch and break the bulb and rip out the wiring or cut the electricity or overload the electricity. You know, then you start getting creative when you really think about it, you know, at a brighter light source, can you see a 20 watt bulb if there's a 120 watt bulb next to it? Uh, don't do anything. Just don't allow anything to change on it. Uh, it'll eventually will, will die, right? Ask someone else to do it for you. And this is social engineering. Uh, cover it. Um, close your eyes. So there's always 10 ways. And uh, then you go deeper, right? If, if the target here was, I want, you know, Joe's password, right? Think of 10 ways to do that. But then you go deeper into how it works. What are the 10 components of a functioning light? What is a hash? What is encryption? What is, so you get into that before you actually uh, just execute on it. You have to have enough knowledge about it. You know, how do I tell the light is on or off? How do I tell if something worked? And think of 10 ways to do that. And ultimately, when you go through this process, you're going deeper and deeper into that knowledge base. And one of the key things to hackers is they learn how to learn really fast about things they know nothing of. If you think back to the original definition, of an amateur, somebody who has no skill or talent and can become a talented, skilled individual in a very short period of time by using this sort of mentality of going deeper and deeper and deeper. At the end, with that knowledge, then you can really list or prevent ways to do to hack, right? to be hacked. That's when you come up with your countermeasures uh, because now you're really operating from a place of, of, of knowledge uh, and intelligence. So... You know, there's lots that uh, we need to do, and, and there's no easy way to address it, but, uh, you know, we have to detect exposure earlier, and exposure is not necessarily the hack. Exposure is, is different. Uh, understanding your exposure and being able to detect new exposure, I just hired a new guy, and that new guy uh, could be a, a liability in ways I didn't, I didn't know. So that's an additional... This exposure because now he has access to things uh, or his access levels may be an exposure. So understanding exposure and detecting exposure earlier uh, is going to allow you to detect an attack earlier, detect vulnerability earlier. Um, and then being able to find who the intruder is, being able to trace and track this stuff down so that you're sort of doing a, a live forensics. You have to assume that it's happening. Uh, and then how you communicate those findings. That's one of the areas that uh, is is a problem um, for for the most part to upper level management and the business folks. Um, they don't really understand the language we speak. It's uh, it's like a doctor speaking to a lawyer. Um, there's just they're, they're talking two different languages. And so, what it's true, uh, it, what it truly means to the business, um, the impact of technology on the business is really what they're interested in more than the technology itself. So uh, oftentimes we come and, you know, we consider that the uh, deliverable of a penetration test is a report. A report that has to be, that probably takes more time to do than the actual penetration test itself, because you now have to take all of this very technical not information and turn it into something that is digestible by a human being, especially in, in management. And, uh, and, and, and oftentimes, even through the digest process, it's not digested enough. It still is going to generate many more questions than answers. So we have to learn to do this better. And most of these issues ultimately lead to something that's been talked about for the last 20 years, and that's secure coding practices. By that, I don't mean secure coding. By that, I mean that as part of the QA process, security be looked at. Not, you know, this is, uh, and I've, heard this and maybe even said it myself once, which is no security, you have to start with security in mind. No, you can't start with security in mind because you will kill functionality and you will kill uh, performance. If you consider, that's, uh, you know, Larry can attest to this. You put a, f a couple of big, uh, big guys at the entrance to any building that say security on it. And uh, I can guarantee you that it's gonna be a lot slower for people to get in if they're gonna be checking everyone. Uh, for, uh, you know, explosives or whatever. The point is security can be definitely get in the way and affect performance, it always does. And depending on how much security you put in place, especially if you put it in front of functionality, then you're going to obviously affect functionality drastically. So uh, the issue here is more a matter of making security 
if you want to use that word, but making uh, the testing of this to be part of the QA process before you deliver a product. Uh, in fact, you know, Sean over here could tell you that, you know, one of these very big companies we worked for was about to put out a product and say, hey, can you take a look at this? And he found major, major flaws in it. And then uh, it took them months before they were released. But you know what? They were going to release it, what, days, days after they gave it to him. This is so, always the challenge, though. You know, one of my favorite security books is by um, uh, Ross Anderson. And he's a brilliant, brilliant guy. He understands security like nobody else. But he also points out that speed to market will trump security. Because if you really try to get it perfectly secure, it's never ready. And, uh, and at a certain point, this is why, like, Microsoft beat out Novell. You know, it's because they were willing to let go of a product that wasn't ready. It's so hard. It's so hard to find that right balance, you know. It, it certainly is, you know, and that's because ultimately it's a, it is a first-to-market world. Otherwise, there's no business, right? Um, so making this part of the QA process is really something that, you know, we don't actually see. We see it. They're not part of the QA process. It's usually after the QA process and, you know, a week or two before they're supposed to launch the thing that they're like, oh, maybe we should pen test it. Um, and then of course you find flaws and vulnerabilities and most of them tend to be coding related, meaning that they can't really be fixed by, you know, by downloading a VM uh, and putting it in front of the infrastructure. So uh, it's, it's one of the things that we have to do better. And, uh, and we can do this and, and this is across the board, one of the things that we don't do like I said, very well, which is kind of ironic for being in the field of communications, is know how to communicate properly. I love that and picture. So, is that you, Ralph? No, that's not me. <laughs> but I'm going to say it is because who knows? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's, we have to be able to, uh, to educate uh, better. And, you know, as you're doing uh, in classes like this, but really also to, to define privacy because uh, that's one of those things that uh, you know i was able to get down to to fewer words selective disclosure because that's what privacy is what do you want to be disclosed uh, about yourself that defines privacy because the truth is as we all know from facebook linkedin or any of those is certainly do put a lot of, out there right but do we really think about what that means to us as far as privacy uh, obviously, a lot of information can lead to other information that isn't necessarily out there. Um, and, and it really isn't a matter of security. It's really a matter of safety. And that's a word we don't use enough, I think. We use this word security, which I think is somewhat uh, intrusive. It's the kind of word that we associate negatively with things. We don't associate the word security with with a good feeling. We associate the word security with that big guy stopping you from getting in the club. So um, it's, it's really more a matter of safety. And that's a, the, the way you feel about these issues is very important to the way we react to them. So uh, it's really more about being and building a resilient environment because you will be hacked. It's just how you deal with it, right? Um, and, and, and from there, we can come up with a lot of innovative ways and techniques, but it's a matter of everyone understanding that they're part of this safety issue, not security, safety issue. And that means everyone, not just the people in security and, and, and IT, but especially the consumers of, who are not creators and who are not involved in the creation and or um, propagation of this technology. So um, that's what we can do better. And so, uh, you know, friend me, uh, you know, uh, you know, let's be friends on the interwebs. And uh, Larry, thank you for having me. And, and oh, I'm going to jump out me. so that we can now talk about, uh, you know, I can take some questions. What was that? You know, we, we've got um, uh, some people here from Peter uh, Diamandis' group. And when you said safety versus security, it, it relates to something that I teach in my class that um, I borrowed this from uh, Bruce Schneier. He says, safety engineering deals with Murphy's Law. If something could go wrong, eventually it will. Security engineering deals with Satan's Law. If something could go wrong, there's a malicious person out there who's going to make it go wrong. Well, Peter Diamandis has the thing, uh, Peter's Law. If something could go wrong, just fix it. 
the hell with Murphy. <laughs> so, I mean, that's our job. We, we try, but that's kind of like the agile thing where it's like, it's like you get it out there, you fix it. You get it out there, you find a flaw, you fix it. But the problem with, um, with, with so much of uh, security issues is you find a flaw, people lose a lot of money or their life. And then you fix it, and that's that's where it's like, wow! I was hoping we didn't get that far. So it's really hard. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. I mean, there's a there's something that we employ in our development process, which uh, some developers know about, called chaos testing. Are you familiar with that? Uh, no, keep uh, going. So well, sounds like almost like fuzzy. No chaos at everything, and see how it responds. Yeah, that's kind of like fuzzing when they when they throw just about anything into a uh, input box. It is. Yeah. It is. But fuzzing is you know specific in a programming term. Uh -huh. you know, chaos is everything. So and the kitchen sink. So this is uh you know have a user do the craziest stuff. I think I, I think Tom up the Grove is on the is in here and he likes a, a scene from. Uh, uh, it's a Jim Carrey pretending to be a martial arts instructor. He calls a, a student up and uh, they, they uh, attack him uh, and, and get if they're able to defeat him, you know, like a street fighter. He goes, no, no, no. See, like most beginners, you're attacking wrong <laughs> because you're expecting somebody to come at you the way you were trained. <laughs> I like it. Oh, true. Um, hang on. Somebody asked, I see here, about uh, Chaos Monkey, yes, yes. Uh, about security challenges in the entertainment industry. And uh, I'm trying to see if I can pull up actually one of my old presentations from. I didn't, I was interrupting too much as it was, and I wanted to set your flow, but you mentioned the Sony hack. You were so prophetic. Just before the Sony hack, Ralph had given a talk uh, about Hollywood hackers. And, and you had told me, I forget who you gave the talk to, but you gave me some heads up. You said, oh, uh, you got to see these. You got to Hollywood and people are like transferring entire new movies that are yet to be uh, uh, released on hard drives, unencrypted. And these execs are using like Gmail. And sure enough, within months, there's the Sony hack. And you were like, well, how's that? Yep, yep, and and so here's uh here I'll share this with you just to give you an idea of of that problem. Um, so consider this: this is the this is sort of Hollywood in, in in breaking it down. So you have you know production companies who obviously I'm gonna get into the finance of Hollywood because that's a whole other interesting hack. But the 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 way things work is that once you've got you know first you have development, which we'll talk about that in a minute, but then you've got into production, editorial, which is editing right and adding music and visual effects and then you have other vendors and so inside of each one of these little bubbles you see how many people are involved in production you may have 10 to 20 people who have to deal with the dailies that come out of these cameras which of course are completely and totally uh digital and then the next level editorial now you got 20 or so different hires you know some studio employees involved versus production employees those are two different people the production is only for that movie studio is a studio then you go into the sound and music there, you've got 60, uh, you know, and a whole bunch of different people involved from the sound companies and music companies. So all of this is digital files. Then you've got the visual effects companies and these, you know, you've got over a thousand people involved. That's why when you see these things kind of rolling off the screen in a movie, you say, oh, well, how come there's so many names, right? Every single person who works on a movie is named, which makes it interesting because it's public information, right? And guess what? They all work on the other movies too. It's a very closed world. And then you've got all of the other vendors when you get into advertising, localization, you know, the Estonian version versus the U.S. version, the scripts and vendors, mm, dubbing, um, film labs for coloring and replication, all kinds of stuff. So this is how many people have different access to that content, which is all digital, right? And then... I'll take you through what the script to screen process is. So you've got the script acquisition. So, and, you know, you hear somebody option the book, very Hollywood. You have to option the rights usually to some existing content unless it's written from scratch. And then you've got development, which is, you know, how are we going to do this? What scenes are we going to cut, leave in, so on and so forth. And then that gets greenlit, meaning, okay, the monies are there. We're going to budget for it. It's been approved. Let's come up with the budgets and the right financing and then boom, okay, now we got to cast it. Usually this is part of development too. Now think about for every single one of these boxes I'm mentioning, how many different pieces of digital communications take place from email 
to files to scripts to you know you name it and then you got okay we cast it larry is going to be our uh, our main man and uh now we got That's location scout <laughs> that would be right and then now we've got you know location scouting where are we going to shoot and we got to hire the crews. We got to hire, you know, production design for, you know, art direction and production scheduling for when principal photography, when are we going to actually shoot this in those places? Then you start processing the dailies, the stuff that's been shot. And there's this pre-visualization. Now they're able to do, there's two positions that never existed in film until about 10 years ago. And that's a data wrangler uh, and a D, DIT, digital imaging technologist. Sounds like they're IT guys, right? They're not IT guys. And those are the only people on a movie set that have anything to even closely do with understanding computers. Um, they are responsible, they work for the camera crew and they are responsible for getting the stuff off the camera, putting it on hard drives. And then pre-visualization has to do with some colorization they can do now. They can actually kind of colorize, uh, color correction. Um, that's what the digital imaging technologists will do. Then you get into editing, editorial as they call it. And then you get into visual effects and adding the visual effects and the sound editorial. Uh, ADR, voiceover, because sometimes the sound wasn't good. So you have to have the actors come back in and read their own lips and say the words again. And then you've got composing all of this and obviously music supervision, scoring the music. And you have no idea how those steps, how important they are to a movie. I've seen a movie with bad scoring and bad music and the same edit is night and day. So visually it's the same movie, but with the wrong audio, it is a crappy movie. With the right audio, it's a great movie. So oh, it's very doubt. interesting. I want to take a, a TV show like Black Mirror and just replace it with the, the sound, with instead of gloomy music, but with like silly Gilligan's Island type background music and a little laugh track. And it would change everything. It would make that show so much more bearable to me. So it's like, he's dead. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. I don't know, I just think it would be fantastic. <laughs> and it would change it drastically. Yes. That's how important that is. And then you got audio mixing and audio mastering and then then you've got this whole package where now it's been packaged into into the actual format that it can be used for print and for distribution and for all of that kind of stuff so uh it, you know then it goes into marketing and different cuts and so on and so and you're saying all at, of each, at each step here this is a, it, it introduces a, 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 an exposure where this data could be uh, hacked or or you know stolen or whatever right these are all and, and, it, and it's happened. I mean, we've got everything from scripts have been leaked in the past uh, to budgets. And obviously the Sony hack is a good example of not only budgets were leaked, but financials were leaked, schedules where you know where people are going to be, uh, obviously including very high profile individuals, contracts, key crew hires that, that, are, uh, that are being hired, obviously cast, all of this information, Hollywood tends to keep very, very quiet and hush hush because every single piece of information is used as leverage in their deal making. All of this information is at risk. Conceptual drawings are all te you know, digitized, set construction information to where the production offices are. You know, of course, what do you think they're operating on? Wi-Fi, uh, post-production post facilities, where their location scouting, scouting. So all of these type of things uh, are all ultimately digital, but there really isn't a, uh, you know, standardized way to deal with this. The MPAA has best practices and certain studios uh, make their service providers. Uh, you know, one of the ones I found was interesting, Disney. When I first started uh, working out in Hollywood and finding out how things kind of work, Disney was one of those that they paid for a third party to pen test you. And if you didn't pass their pen test, you can't work with Sony. Um, so That's visual good. effects providers, uh, they did that to visual effects providers. So uh, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, interesting. Now, for the most part, Hollywood just doesn't really have a freaking clue, to be honest. There is, got to keep in mind, this is not, you would think they do with all the hundreds and millions and hundreds of billions of dollars that they're spending on making movies, but the truth is they really don't. And uh, only in very few instances on very few sets 
uh, do they actually employ any kind of real IT and, and or security? I saw your name and I, I let you know about this. Get you got a, a kudos for for your work out there uh, on the Colbert Report, or actually on the on the Late Show with Colbert, Stephen Colbert, when um, uh, <laughs> when Snowden came out. Was it Gordon? Uh, it was in the Joseph Gordon, uh, help me out with his full name, the story. Joseph Gordon Levy, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got Levy. kudos, I got kudos for a couple of things on that one. Yeah, they asked you. Know, I, I know the other one that you speak of, Joe. But they asked him, they said, aren't you worried about somebody hacking your movie? And he said, well, we had a guy out there, Ralph H. Medea. Yeah, and he mentioned a couple of things about it. <laughs> yeah, and that was one that, in fact, myself and Sean were both here, were both involved in, because not only... Uh, I, I more than anything worked by being on set and, and working with uh, Oliver and, and the writer um, on Karen Fitzgerald uh, was the writer's name and I'm um, basically taking a lot of this information that they got from Snowden and and to, you know trying to make it uh, more realistic into the scene and in, in the actual writing and then working with the art direction and all of those other departments that had to do with uh, with uh making sure that what was on screen was not complete and total bullshit so and there's a balance there because it is ultimately still entertainment so there are there are places where i have to put my hands up and go okay you're right about that oliver you know we don't need to see that step on screen <laughs> but he that's didn't do an step. mf scan yet <laughs> he yeah, forgot to see the thing story. not the filterized cmp oliver people are gonna laugh no, uh, yeah, I don't want to put yeah, you yeah. on the spot, but we were running a little, little time. But uh, I know you're working on a product to help a bunch of people. Uh, do you, can you say something quick about uh, where you are on Seguru? Well, yeah, we are uh, set to launch Seguru May 1st, May Day. Get it? Um, uh, in a, at, a, at a conference called Collision in New Orleans, um, which is the sister to Web Summit. And uh, Web Summit is Outside of the U.S. is the largest conference in the world with 65,000 people. And I did a thing at Web Summit, which you can find online. And, uh, and now we're taking it to collision for the actual launch of Seguru. I, uh, I can basically you, can just you get did. A, in a couple sentences explain to, the, to our, our, our audience here what Seguru uh, will do for that. This is for it is, it is a, let's, let's call it a mobile safety application um, for, for mobile for, for consumers. And what it does is it basically shows you exactly what your phone is talking to around the world um, and, and gives you information about those communications um, so that you can become more aware of what your phone is doing. You'd be surprised to what your phone is talking to. Uh, obviously, whether it's legitimate communications to say Facebook or illegitimate communications to say China or Russia, you will now see this. So if you backdoor anything from the hardware to an app, you're now going to sort of see that. Uh, communication take place because everything in in today's world is you know sort of call home apps nothing is usually uh, written to just get on onto your device and and, uh, and and delete it it's usually intended to call home and then home tells it what to do so so that's how we can we basically focused on detection at a mass level and uh, and by applying our, an our analysis and knowledge to basically automating that AI um, automating our analysis uh, into into the software and making it very simple for grandma to understand. So. Now, I, I want to see the feedback from the students here. I've been asking around, for, I, I believe in this product, and so I, I, I've been uh, picking them on it. Uh, and one of the things I'd love to see happen someday is I want more voice interfaces. I'm in love with my Alexa. She's in the other room. I don't have her in here. But I want to be able to say, and I am a Wireshark user, so I want to say, hey, Alexa, uh, what other right, uh, countries have I spoken to today? Who's my phone talking? So I want a voice interface to all these things. What do you guys think? Would you like to be able to have, talk to your antivirus software and through Alexa, Alexa, uh, what's this alert? Who is this? I don't want to have to like click it around. Yeah, they like it. They like it. We're going to have to give Siguru. Actually, Siguru, the concept is it's called Siguru, which kind of comes from the idea of the word Seguro in Spanish. It also comes from the fact that, you know, you can be your own security guru. Um, and uh, actually, Siguru is the name of the app, but uh, there's a, uh, an icon in there. Uh, a little personality that we call Seymour. And that's the idea is he allows you to see more and explains to you what you're seeing. Love it, love it, love it. There you go. What? See more. There you go. My soundtrack. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
but uh, but the idea is that you can be your own security guru. So the idea. Right, Tom says only a sexy voice. You know what? I have to admit, I like Alexa's voice. And sometimes I just wish she was nicer to me. Or, you know, like when she, I say, Alexa, turn on the living room lights. And she goes, there you go, or whatever she says. And I always say, thank you. I want her to go, you're welcome. <laughs> I want to flirt with me a little. Oh, I'm glad that. <laughs> we'll work on that, Larry. We'll work on that. It'll be in version 2.0. The other thing I had was in my car GPS when I was able to set the, uh, the voice to, I used to set it to the British English. So I'd, it'd say, um, Turn right in approximately 300 yards. And I'd always say, thank you, Alfred. I wanted to come back and say, you're quite welcome, Master Bruce. <laughs> we're, we're definitely going to have to use some of the Hollywood in here to get this. Uh, yeah, so going. give Seymour, if it's going to be a guy, let's, let's, give him a, let's give him a British, you know, butler voice. Oh, of course, dude, his name is Seymour. That's not a British name. What is? I like it. You're quite welcome, Master. <laughs> Awesome. So yeah, so that's what it is. You guys can check out seguru.io. There's a little bit of information there that I'll we'll be changing. We are uh, uh, Robert wants to know as security sure. goes, should we not be concerned with regards to devices like Alexa? Yeah, I, I absolutely yeah, yes, it is being recorded, Mike. Uh, I absolutely do uh, think about that, and I've had um, uh, people say, "Oh, I don't want an Alexa because they're on all the phone, I, on all the time." And I said, "Well, so is your phone." So I don't know that you uh, we lost Ralph there. I, I don't know that, uh, you know, you're no, ready. You didn't, lose me. I, 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 you didn't lose me. I'm here. I oh, just, okay. Un, so, uh, I but you, you, you do have to worry, and I worry about how are they storing it. Now, I'm a big fan of Jeff Bezos, and um, uh, I, I, I trust him as much as I trust, you know, Sprint, uh, who has my phone. So, um, you know, if, you're, if you trust your phone, you, you know, are you, is it any worse? But... Is it uh, the bigger concern is like, could they subpoena it or something? And then all of a sudden they're listening to all kinds of things. And I have Alexa. I remember getting a baby monitor and realizing that the baby monitor was on during an intimate moment. And I was like, oh, I hope the neighbors enjoyed that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, these are concerns. And Mike, you sent that to me privately, but the question is this being recorded and I will. I will post this uh, to YouTube so you guys can all see this. Any other questions for Rep? Thank you, guys. Um, thank you, Larry, for having me. Oh, and, thank you very much for, for sitting in on here. I, I really appreciate it. And, uh, no, wait, 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 put a soundtrack here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, guys. And uh, again, I'm going to put this out to YouTube so everybody can see it. And uh, Ralph, live long and prosper. I can't wait to hook up with you again. Yeah. Take care. Nice to hear for your, 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 your face there, Sean. Any clue? Yeah. You got the thumb wrong. The thumb goes out. There you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> West Side. West Side. All right, man. Nice, brother. Thank you. Nice, brother. Pleasure hands. Take